And, you know, in a day, in the era of Fox News, let's face it, uh, it's all about entertainment, isn't it? You know, there's no, uh, you know, uh, facts are uh, irrelevant. Anyhow, this is um, a brief video, which I'll show you as a video rather than anything else, because it's more fun, um, by a chap called Alan Fisk. And it saves me talking, too. Now, let's... ...major human relationship types across the world's cultures. Each prescribes a distinct way of distributing resources, each has a distinct evolutionary basis, and each applies most naturally to certain people, but can be extended through negotiation to others, and that's where language comes in. So there's dominance, as I've uh, mentioned, whose logic is don't mess with me, and which presumably we inherited from the dominance hierarchies that are ubiquitous among uh, Very different from that is communality, the ethos share and share alike which uh, evolved by a different route, namely kin selection and mutualism, and therefore is extended by default to kin, uh, to spouses, and among close friends. Finally, there's reciprocity, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, uh, which pertains to the business-like tit-for-tat exchanges of goods and services that characterizes reciprocal altruism. Now, behavior that's acceptable in one relationship type can be anomalous in another. For example, at a drinks party, you might go over to your husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend and help yourself to a prawn off their plate. But you wouldn't go up to your boss and help yourself to a prawn off his plate because what you can get away with in a communality relationship, you can't get away with in a dominance relationship. Likewise, uh, at the end of a dinner party, if you pulled out your wallet and offered to pay the host for the dinner, that would not be perceived as fair, that would be perceived as crass. Because because the clash between reciprocity, which would, is what would be appropriate, say, at a restaurant, and communality, which is what we deem appropriate at a... So, there you go. Anyhow, next time you're tempted to tip your host, uh, that's, that's perhaps helpful. Anyhow, I hope I gave you just a flavor of, of RSA Animate and, and, you know, the fun things that they're doing. Um, and, you know, just taking a, a talk there by a, you know, a social scientist. But let's try and apply that to, to free software. Um, so I have some stills here for the, uh, you know, the rare case that it doesn't work. So uh, I think it's pretty clear we're aiming for that communality relationship, aren't we? You know, community, communality. It's a similar word, right? Kind of, kind of obvious. Um, so I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a community and you've, you know, and it's felt wrong. There's some, been something really, really bad going on there. I know, I, I certainly have. Um, and, and, and I think it's quite, quite possibly because, in fact, it's actually a dominance relationship. The, the relationship you have is not a relationship that's this, this, this kind of kin, kin, mutualism, you know, sharing and so on, but really, you know, being told what to do. It feels like you're being in a, in a company, you know. And so, really, I, I think the, one of the keys to, to getting uh, these things right is to uh, lay that relational foundation at the bottom uh, that is communality. And so we end up with, uh, you know, it, when it goes wrong, we end up with relationships that, that you get this kind of problems in, where, you know, someone owns it, and there they have a special ownership right, and you don't, and you have to somehow interact with them in a way that is just profoundly awkward, and I think creates conflict. So, um, hmm, yes. So there, there was a, a great trend years ago, uh, I think, Eric Raymond. I mean, I, I don't know, there's many good things came out of the open source uh, thing instead of free software, but I, I'm really a free software guy. Uh, but, you know, at one stage, there was a lot of talk of harvesting intellectual property and, you know, companies leveraging n leveraging probably, you know, uh, the, the, the free software community to build products for them and so on. And uh, so often we ended up with a, a governance that looked a bit like this. You know, the big corporation owns everything, uh, the code, the copyright, trademark, domains, all kinds of meaningful rights. And then they give you a very limited license back. And so they're actually quite interested in, in limiting that license even further. Um, so. Um, that, that, that leads to some interesting effects, but everyone gives the rights to the big corporation. And so this needs really a lot of effort to dress up as a communality, community relationship. You know, you need community managers, you need, you need people to go out there and persuade people that this is all reasonable and rational, and, and Big Corp really needs those rights to, to help you. You know, it's actually, there is something coming back. And so, yeah, I, I don't know that this model actually works uh, at all successfully. Uh, I, I would not recommend it to you. And, and when you see something that looks like this, I think it's worth uh, running uh, a long way away. So how about um, you know, trying to f fuse the two? So intersecting that money-making impulse uh, with the, the sharing. And I think you can do that. 
This is a, a brief take on the Apache model, which instantly I think is reasonably good. Uh, you know, it's, it's much better than the previous uh, big corp dominance model. Um, so I think, you know, clearly, you know, everyone has a, a reciprocal, you know, the volunteers who are primarily interested in sharing everything they're doing have, have a very similar relationship with each other and with the central uh, Apache Software Foundation that, that licenses things. Of course, uh, corporations get to uh, take the code from that. And then they get to decide whether they contribute any patches back. You know, um, so this is, you know, huh. I guess the foundation of very, very weak uh, copyleft licenses and, uh, or non-copyleft licenses. And then, the, you know, what proprietary features uh, they keep. So, in fact, in this relationship, you give away a lot of your rights uh, to a central entity, um, which you could see as that dominant, you know, dinosaur in the middle, if you want to. Um, but luckily, you know, the, the governance hopefully exists to convince you that you're in control, you know, actually you're giving it to yourself because we're all in it together and we're all, you know, uh, part of that foundation and so actually we're just really sharing this. It's an efficient way to share that and you're in control. And that's, you know, a great way to do it. I think there's some concerns about the scalability of that. Obviously the bigger it gets, the less influence you have on any of those things, but it seems to be, it seems to be good. No entity then has privileged rights. Of course, my personal preferred way uh, is, is a better way, you know, so that you use a weak copyleft license and that everyone is, you know, frenetically sharing in a decentralized way uh, that doesn't require uh, any, any kind of uh, foo in the middle. And of course, uh, that then builds relationship as the central uh, piece in your community. You don't have a hub and spokes model necessarily around a foundation. You, you deal with other people and you build the string you know, the, the relationships, particularly that we, you know, we cement and strengthen at conferences, they're really the backbone of, of everything we do. Um, of course, you still need some kind of entity for trademark, domain stewardship, blah, 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 all this sort of thing. But I don't know, I think this is much helpful. And, and being a, a copy leftist, you know, not having to make the decision as to whether to open source your fixes or not, I think is a profoundly helpful uh, thing. And, uh, you know, if uh, you can avoid this bit too with the GPL, that's kind of good too. So the license then provides a lot more of the governments, um, creates a very low barrier to entry, much, much better, improves sharing. One of the problems in the world at the moment that I keep banging on about is that in the cloud world, um, there is no way really to do anything except a big corp type startup because there's no lesser Afro GPL. And it's possible that the cloud revolution will, will burn itself out having produced no reusable free software. What do I mean about that? Well, if you're starting a company, clearly, you know, there is some degree of, of uh, problems bootstrapping a uh, pure copyleft business model. At least I would argue so. And that having some kind of hybrid where you have some kind of proprietary value add, hopefully that goes away over time, can be attractive. Um, unfortunately, that's impossible at the moment with a, a cloud compatible Afro license. Um, and so typically, everyone does it with an ALGPL outbound. So if we go back a couple of slides, you know, the uh, limited license is then the AGPL, and then they do it with the this inbound. And what does that mean? Well, that means that basically none of these business models scale. So no one is reusing other people's AGPL code because the very purpose of it is to own the rights and to provide proprietary things, right? That's why you're doing it. And so my suspicion is that, uh, you know, lots of uh, tactically badly licensed code will be left to the, the world as the cloud bubble collapses, or maybe it will continue indefinitely, but uh, who knows. Um, so, controversial enough for you? Questions in a minute. Conclusions. Okay, so uh, communality is key. You know, community is built of relationships. It's not built of mailing lists or governance or other things. Um, those relationships need to be communality relationships, not dominance relationships or, you know, for pay, paid for, uh, paying for stuff. So, uh, yeah, dominance actually is death. It kills your community. And Maybe it hasn't killed it yet, but it will. Benign influence is much better. And so, yeah, weak copyleft's work. There is a great deal of goodness in that sort of scalable anarchy that actually reflects a fundamental uh, property of, of human relationships. That's, that's what it's about. So, yeah, um, encourage your friendly lawyer for the Afro GPL. Uh, yeah, why not? Go and, go and uh, encourage them. So, yeah, lots of rambling there. The Royal Society Arts really recommend lots of their talks, many of which I disagree with, but are well presented and thought provoking. So that's my short talk on copyright assignment, communality. Questions? Go for it, sir. That sounds like a promising question.
So, so the problem that you're uh, highlighting with the lack of a, of a lesser feral GPL, sure, sure. Um, <coughs> is that not the same problem that we had with the GPL for like distributed software? Uh, for distributed software, as in multiple machines, used on multiple machines, or well, non-cloud software. Non software. Yeah, so the GPL, of course, you know, if you're actually receiving the software yourself rather than connecting to it remotely, um, then yes, what I'm trying to say is that there's a GPL and LGPL distinction that we have for software we, we receive that's distributed, and it would be nice to have that distinction. In fact, it's really important to have that distinction for the AFRO attempt to extend that over the network. I, I think that's really important. Uh, so, does that clarify it, or was it a different question? So, I guess you have the same sort of. Uh, you would have the, the same criticism for a, um, a, a business model where you, the code is under the GPL and there's copyright assignments. Right? Uh huh. Okay. It's doomed. I think it's fundamentally doomed. It may look quite good in the, in the short run, but you know, the, there are so many weaknesses with that. So, you know, as soon as you start to try and engage with other people, and I don't think any single company can really take this stuff on, as soon as you try to engage with another company to share that code and to build their company around your code too, you, you end up with a relationship like this, right? There's all going to be some quid pro quo. Are they going to contribute? How can they ramp up their contribution? How important is it? Uh, and a business relationship goes on like this, and I've seen these happen between big companies, and they take up the order of six months and hundreds of hundreds of man hours and negotiation tactics and going in and out and all this sort of rubbish all of which is totally pointless in the meantime the industry has changed you lost much better to have a small piece that's proprietary and a license allows you to do that and share the rest of it because that is the bit that's going to scale and grow and make your business attractive so yeah i, I would say uh yeah a copyright assignment as a tool to grow your business is profoundly foolish um, there are much better ways to achieve a good business uh, result, uh, and it drives contributors away. That's, that's my personal experience and uh, opinion, but lots beg to differ, of course. I'm just confused about where you would see a project like Sambo, which is a strong sure. full GPL model for the main code base, yeah, yeah. and which we have a large number of independent contributors, in fact, you know, sure, sure. and large companies very happily working with each other. Yep. Uh, building it. We don't see of course. some of these things. And I think in. that's basically this relationship. Yeah. You all share the same license, yeah. you all get the same rights, everyone's happy with that that's there. If they're not happy with that, they're not there. You know, <laughs> they go somewhere else, right? So yeah, I think that's a fine. I think it's a great model. I think it fits that. I think it's a true community, some yeah. community. Okay. And yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's only when you start to get the copyright assignment stuff in and all, it's this quest for a business model around it. Now, I suspect that many of the people working with you are either doing support, they have a support-based business model, or they're device vendors who are fundamentally most, selling most, a... Mostly device vendors. Right. So they're fundamentally selling a solution, and the software is an enabler of that, but it's not really their proprietary value. Their, their value is in the brand or in you know, the, the size of the box or getting three discs in. I mean, like, how can you sell RAID systems that have two discs in by default? It's just <laughs> totally stupid. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm a believer in, you know... Uh, anyway, so yeah, I mean, my discs fail all the time. Halving the storage is sort of... Anyway, does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Another question at the back. How are we doing for time, actually, Michael? Are we, are we doing... Yeah, two minutes. Two minutes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see it contrasting with something like the uh, S FSF's copyright assignment mm -hmm. policy? I mean, I'll say some nice things about the FSF, first of all. I think that's important. You know, I think the FSF is not a rapacious corporate entity, uh, you know, which I have drawn carefully here as a, as a large dragon or, or, or whatever. Let me, in fact, press this one. It should hopefully get there. Mm. Yeah, quicker. So I, I don't think the FSF looks primarily like this, you know? I, I, you know, to, to a large degree, I think they have hearts of gold and they are trying to do the right thing for free software. And they're more pragmatic than many people give them credit for. So I think that's... Uh, that, that's fair. I think in, in terms of you know, the, the other models we discussed, personally, I think if you're assigning rights to your code, I would encourage you to have some, be some part of a governance that respects what you've done there. So I, I think that would be the only slight concern I would have about the FSF. But really, you know, I have no problem with them. I think that the heart's in the right place. Really, the, the corporate, the conflict of the profit motive and you know, shareholder uh, you know, uh, interest and so on with uh, exploiting this asset that you own. Which is, they're, they're legally bound. 
Right, absolutely. And then their fiduciary duty is to extract the maximum uh, profit possible from it, not to do a lovey, uh, uh, feely, isn't it great, we're all working together to, for the good of humanity. And, um, yeah, so I, I think actually, you know, the, the, if, if you read up on economics, you know, there's basically this evil in human beings, which is, you know, the selfishness that you're trying to harness and constrain for the common good by creating companies. And, I, you know, and it works, right? You know, that's what we see in society. It's, it's one of the best ways of, of turning all of our selfishness and greed into, into something positive, which seems to be freedom and, and choice and, and products, which is great. I think the only problem is that when you misstructure it, uh, like can easily happen with companies in this case, yeah, you don't end up with anything good. You end up with, you know, kind of monopoly, dominance, poor relationships, control, and it all goes to pot. Well, I think that's just an unfortunate side effect of a new... You know, way of interacting that companies aren't particularly good at yet. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh.